Uh, Naima Morgan is a Chicago-based multidisciplinary artist. Her work has been exhibited at the Drawing Center, the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art, Mar Marlboro Contemporary, Grand Walquist Gallery, Gallery Jean Roche Dard in Paris, France, and the CSS Bard Galleries, Bard College, New York. Some of Morgan's awards and residencies include an Art Matters grant, uh, the Joan Mitchell Painters and Sculptors grant, LMCC Workspace Residency, and Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. Her works have been included in the Wall Street Journal, Time Out New York, and Art Forum. Morgan earned an MFA from the California College of Arts and a BFA from Cooper Union School of Art. Um, more, I, I think, uh, uh, for me, this is like, it's all wonderful. And there's like, I feel like Naima's bio could go on for another uh, hour and a half if we really went through all of her awards and accolades and shows. But um, Naima is a close friend of mine. We've been friends for about 10 years. And I was just saying right before we started this webinar that um, one of the highlights of uh, my position here at Cranbrook is that I get to um, connect with about connecting with I like to. So um, Naima is one of those folks. I'm really glad to um, have her share with you all. Um, lastly, I want to give a quick Cooper, there's a bit of, sorry to interrupt, there's some technical difficulties. You seem to have a, uh, a lag in your audio. Yeah. We may have lost him. We may have. <laughs> oh no, farewell, Cooper. Well, uh, I can continue and I'm sure he'll join in, he'll, He'll log in um, again uh, after everything is sorted out. But I wanted to thank Cooper for inviting me. Uh, we met in 2009 in Skowhegan. Um, I kind of long admired his work from a distance and it's, it's great to have this opportunity to, to kind of reconnect and to share a little bit um, about my work. Um, I'm going to what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to focus on um, some works that I made in the last few years. So definitely things that I've been working on during the pandemic and then probably back to 2018. What I'm showing you, it's not really in chronological order, um, but I'll just, I'm just going to be jumping around a little bit. And if there's a, some more time towards the end, I can kind of go further back in time and show you some work. There he is, Cooper. Hi. Uh, <laughs> Apologies, everyone. Uh, one of my kids unplugged the Wi-Fi router. So, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> with, with that grandiose introduction, <laughs> Naima Morgan, I am pleased. To she probably already got started a minute ago. I, I did. I did. Wi-Fi. <laughs> kids, kids one, parent zero. All right. <laughs> Um, I, I was just explaining, Cooper, that I was going to show, I was going to focus on some uh, recent works over the last few years, probably the last three years, and um, it's not really in chronological order, um, so I'm going to jump around, and then if there's time towards the end, I'll go back to some, to some previous works. So, um, I wanted to start off by focusing on the work that I've been making during the, the pandemic. And I, of course, for all of us, it's been, this has been a, a really tough, to say the least, um, past year. But I think there has been, for me, there's been a bit of a silver lining where it's kind of afforded me the time to really um, be with my thoughts, to focus on my studio practice and, and not be pulled away from it like I, like I usually am. Um, my, I'm fortunate enough here in Chicago to have a live workspace 
so I can kind of go down and work whenever I need to in the middle of the night or, or really early in the morning. So I found myself being really productive. You know, I've talked to other artists, some of whom said, you know, you know, it's, it's hard to make work during the pandemic with everything that's, that's going on. And I feel like um, before the pandemic, um, I was very much distracted by by kind of the world and i wouldn't say maybe distracted isn't the right isn't the right word but you know there's there's the, all the things that one has to do in their daily life and the things that they have to negotiate you know whether it's your job you know um a social life and and all of that um or family you know extended family so in isolation i was really able to kind of sit with myself um, with my thoughts and with my work. So prior, maybe it was late 2019, I was asked to do an exhibition um, by a friend who has a uh, kind of apartment gallery exhibition space um, called Table in Chicago. And I had already been thinking about some work that I wanted to do. And so when he invited me, it seemed like a really perfect kind of fit with the mission of the space that he has. Um, and before I really jump into that, um, I'm gonna show you a, a few different works. And one of the comments or the observations that I get a lot is that, you know, my work is very, is, is very different. So I'll move from drawing to sculpture to installation. And I never know how to take that kind of observation. So I feel like, oh wait, am I doing something wrong? You know, <laughs> um, but, what really leads all of the works that I make are a series of questions, a series of observations and questions um, that I have that are either directed at the world, uh, inward to myself or material or process or something like that. So that's what leads all of, all of the works. And there is, there is a kind of a, a thread that runs through these works of different subjects and different themes I'm related but slightly kind of uh, nuanced and in variation. So this work here, when I show you the slides, I actually added some of those observations and questions that preceded the work. So when I get to certain images, you'll see some of those um, on the side there. So at the time, the work that I, let's see if I can get to that slide. The work that I'm referring to that I started in 2019 that I'm still working on now is called Soft Power, Hard Margins. And it was me kind of thinking about my relationship to um, my kind of troubled relationship to art history and the legacy of, legacy of art history. Um, and I also had been reading and rereading some text by Adrienne Piper and was really inspired by an essay she wrote in, in 1983. It was an essay in response to a controversial exhibition at, uh, in New York. It was a white artist and he had named his show and he used a racial slur in the title of his show. Um, and so she was talking about art world politics and she made a, she made a statement she, in her text. She said, secondly, the right to freedom of expression is a permission granted by the state to engage in certain activities, but not everything is permitted, nor can everything that is permitted be justified. Third, the right to unlimited freedom of artistic expression in any case can only have application to a legitimate subject of rights. We normally grant such rights only to fully mature and responsible adults who understand in some sense the difference between right and wrong and who can be relied upon not to abuse their freedom. Um, so that's by artist philosopher Adrian Piper. So as I was reading the Piper and thinking about art history um, and these as kind of sanctioned works um, that have a very specific kind of expressive, um, have a very specific kind of significance, a significance that might change depending on the, the specific time that the work is viewing, being viewed. Um, I started to examine those works, you know, those seminal works, those great works um, in art history. And I started to write permission, a permission that the works grant as a form of kind of expression through the work. 
Um, so observation. So the history of art relegates the contributions of black artists to a narrow field of influence. The experiences of people of color are not considered universal, but are peripheral. Um, and then questions that I had were how are American ideals of freedom, autonomy, patriarchy, transgression, and et cetera, reinforced through sanctioned culture works? And what is the hierarchy of legibility between image, object, and text? So I started to write these permissions and create this large body of about 40 works, um, pulling seminal works from art history and examining them, writing this permission that they give. Um, and creating, I guess, a hierarchy amongst those works of their cultural significance. So out of these 40 individual works, there are three different sizes. I'm still working on these at the moment, so I don't have images that represent all, this, all those different, those three variations. But there's the smaller ones, which are these, which represent the kind of avant-garde works that, uh, most likely someone outside of the, the art community would not be familiar with. Um, then you have the second tier works, which are works that hold a space kind of in the public consciousness, but maybe it's not easily identifiable. And then you have the, the, the group of works which are represented by the larger size, the ones that you could probably ask your grandmother or, or your aunt you know, to name you know, an artwork and they would know it by name and image. Um, so those are the three kind of groupings, the three tiers of works. Um, the previous one was Soft Power, Hard Margins, 1981, and the date refers to the work that it's referencing. This is another here. These are cast in resin. Here's another. Soft Power, Hard Margins, Permission to Kill Your Father. The text here is, is broken up as a way to kind of slow down our reading and to really kind of emphasize the process of making meaning rather than it being something that happens so immediately that we take for granted. So here's a studio shot of, of some of the works that have been done. You can see here, these are the two sizes, the smallest and then the medium size frames. This one says permission to evoke the self-sacrifice of ingenuity, which maybe I, now I'm second guessing the text and thinking maybe the heroic self-sacrifice of ingenuity. Permission to be reductive. permission to be nostalgic for American provincialism. There's another shot in the studio. And then also I wanted to share a few images of the process kind of of making of making this work. There is a, a, an element of fabrication, a kind of technical process involved in a lot of my work that kind of has to do with my, my training kind of as an artist or an, even before kind of art school. And it's something that's always kind of, I viewed as like a blessing and a curse where I'm always, you know, trying to um, not fall in completely and give in to this kind of tight kind of rendering or fabrication, but, but emphasize that and let the, this process of making and fabricating be uh, an integral part or an integral subject um, about how we produce objects and make objects, which is why the frames and soft power, hard margins, they're, they're raw. You know, it's just the resin. Um, you'll see in some of the images, the resin has spilt over. Um, has, you could see the spillover of some of the, the resin on the flanges there. Um, and leaving it partially gilded to expose that material, that plastic kind of material. So here are a few images from the studio as the work is being made. And 
And so I really, you know, for the last, I guess it was the end of 2019 to the pandemic, I really kind of threw myself and focused on, on this work. So it's, it's kept me preoccupied for the entire year. And, and now, you know, as uh, I work towards finishing up for the show that opens in May. Um, and then I wanted to move into a recent show that I had that happened during the pandemic at the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art. And I was invited to do the show probably in late 2019. So there was the invitation to do the show um, by the curator Rose Van Merlo. Um, and she was the guest curator at the Boulder Museum. And she was asked by the museum to create a, a year's worth of programming related to the centennial of women's suffrage, which happened last year. So um, I had the invitation, the pandemic hit, there was a bit of a question about whether or not we should postpone the show, but because of its um, relationship to the centennial of the museum, it was like, you know, it's really appropriate that we, that we continue with this programming for the year and, and do the best that we can. So I really appreciate them kind of doing that and it was good you know a few people were able to see the show they had to shut down for a while but once it opened you know people were able to come in you know slowly and see the show and it was extended so so it ran for quite some time i think it was originally slated for three months and then it ended up running from uh september until january of this year so in that show you know when the curator approached me and said you know this the, the exhibitions we want to do are related to the centennial of women's suffrage. You know, I, I thought, well, you know, it's women's, the women's suffrage movement and the women's right to vote, it wasn't granted, it wasn't a right that was granted to all women. So I always felt growing up, it wasn't something that I could fully celebrate knowing that, you know, women of color were excluded from that. Um, but when I saw the programming that Rose did before this show, I could see that she, that that was what she kind of wanted to focus on with some of the challenges of that. Um, and so I was excited to kind of present new, these kind of new works that, that, that were critical of, of, of these ideas about power and agency, subjectivity and objectivity. Um, and so at the time I had started making soft power hard margins and I decided that I was going to do a smaller kind of offshoot of that work, examining seminal works by, by women artists. Um, so there were seven pieces from soft power hard margins that were in this show. And then there was also what you're seeing on the right is a fragment of a larger installation um, where the exhibition takes its title from. The, the title of the exhibition is called The Stem, The Flower, The Root, The Seed. And so here's one of the soft power works from that show. Also um, interspersed throughout the exhibition, there was some vinyl text that was on the wall. It was white vinyl text on the white wall and that was a work called The Flower Number Four, which is an iteration, number four because it's an iteration of, this, of, of that text-based work. Um, and the text that you're barely seeing, you can kind of see it um, between the two pieces right above it and then over in the left-hand corner. There's also small text in the middle, but these are stories uh, mythological stories, uh, fables, fairy tales, real life stories um, about the lives of women that have been reduced to this kind of uh, crude summary, this kind of one sentence. And they all begin with the one about. So the ones that you can barely see here, it's the one about the enchanted maiden whose curse was broken by a kiss. Um, the one about the jaded pop star, who had a public mental breakdown. Here's another image where you can see the, the vinyl a little bit better. Um, it was really discreet, that text was really discreet. So you can only, it's, it's a best experienced in person. So that was another reason why, you know, it was, 
it was unfortunate that it happened during the pandemic. Not that many people could see it. I couldn't even go to see the show. Um, so this kind of, kind of subtle addition to the exhibition, it's something that you kind of catch as you walk and move through the space as the light hits the surface of the vinyl, then you'll see text that kind of appears up against, you know, the molding at the top of the wall or the bottom, um, just throughout the entire space. And this is the installation, the stem, the flower, the root, the seed. It's another kind of partial installation. Same here. You can catch some of the vinyl text on the wall. I'm trying to see if I have a fuller image. Um, but basically it's a, I think it's about, maybe there's seven or nine of these kind of really raw cast hands. They're cast, um, they are cast of the hands of uh, women and people identifying women as women here in Chicago. Um, and it's very, like I said, it's very raw and exposed um, unadorned uh, material. And they're holding these wooden dowels. So it's installed in a way that the, that the wooden rods create this kind of arc. So when you step up into the piece, you're partially, not surrounded, but you potentially, it appears as if you're, you're being kind of surrounded. And it's at a height where the rods end at your eye level. So there is these very kind of uh, ambiguous gestures um, here with the kind of alluding to kind of the, like the white flag, um, but also defensive gestures with these staffs kind of pointing, circling you and, and pointing at you. On the wooden rods are sheets of, um, their newsprint broadsheets, um, the dimensions of a uh, printed newsprint, uh, newspaper, like the New York Times. Um, and they are, they are takeaways, so people are allowed to take one with them. On the inside, there is printed uh, imagery, which I'll get to, and text. So some questions and observations that preceded the work. Um, women's right to vote as the result of the suffrage movement didn't secure the right for all women. How do I make work that evokes both offense and defense, and how do I implicate the viewer? So here is a... a a larger view of that installation of, of hands there. So it's actually kind of an, like I said, an arc. Here from the outside, you can kind of vaguely see that there's something printed on the inside. There's a close up. And that was actually inspired by, it's, this work began with a work that I did in 2012, um, a work that I had made that hadn't, I hadn't quite settled yet. So I made it, it was sitting in the studio. There were some things that weren't quite resolved. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, I was unsure, but I knew that I wanted to return to this. So this was the opportunity uh, for me to do that. So this was the first one that I did in 2012. There was nothing printed on the newsprint, and this was in the Spring Break Art Show in New York in 2013. So here are a few images um, from the studio of that in progress as it's being made. Casting the hands of a friend during the pandemic. So it was never, for me, there was never any question about should I continue making work during the pandemic, I felt compelled, like I had all this work to make. I, right before the pandemic, I had come out of some traumatic kind of family issues, which had prevented me from thinking about my work and making my work for probably two or three years. So right after that, it was like this wellspring of, of things that I had wanted to make and to actualize, and then the pandemic hit. So I just used that opportunity to just keep, keep going and thankfully, you know, with the support of friends, encouragement of friends as well, um, I was able to get a lot of these, these works done. So the newsprint broadsheet. So this was what was printed um, on the inside. The, the broadsheet is called the flower number three. The vinyl text on the wall was the flower number four. 
Um, the title of the flower and the title of the show, The Stem, The Flower, The Root, The Seed, was um, a reference to, uh, it was a reference to a German philosopher who was talking about the pr a problem of, philosoph of philosophic discourse um, where contributors to the field often, often will write from the position of either negating someone's work or either um, uh, affirming or supporting the work, rather than taking this holistic kind of view of all of their works kind of together collaboratively. And he used, um, he was describing it, he used the kind of metaphor describing a plant um, and the absurdity of questioning which aspect of the plant in whatever phase of its growth was the most essential part of the, the whole being. You know whether it was the whether it was the um, the petals or the buds, you know, um, but rather it is all of these things that kind of are an integral part of its of its being and its becoming. So uh, thinking about that metaphor, um, I kind of used that as the title for the work. Um, so the broadsheet is the flower number three. And here again, we have a lot of the text that was presented on the wall uh, about the, the lives of, of women in different forms. So uh, the one about the girl who married the sky spirit, the one about the teenage girl's existential reflection in the face of genocidal horror, the one about the woman who got her groove back, the one about the pagan martyr, the one about the youthful ingenue, the one about the demon temptress, um, the one about the tiger mom, the one about the other woman, the one about the girl next door, the one about the warrior, about the tribe of women warriors. And it kind of goes on uh, with these kind of archetypes. So observations, stories about the lives of women are archetypical questions. How do the stories about the lives of BIPOC and queer women differ from, differ from conventional stories about women, womanhood, and femininity? All of, these, all of these texts that I'm referring to, my process for writing them were simply just I mean, I shouldn't say simply, but we're basically um, me kind of sitting down and extracting from my own memory the different cultural stories about women that I've heard throughout my entire life and recognizing that I remember them because they are supposed to, these stories bear some type of significance and often a type of allegorical significance, okay? So the women are presented as um, a type of archetype um, that we are to reflect on and ref to reflect on about the ways that women kind of exist in the world and perform in the world. The one about the mother's impossible decision, the one about the sacrificial virgins, the one about the wicked witch of the West, the one about the wife who cut off her husband's penis, the one about, about the anti-war communist sympathizing actress, the one about the fairy godmother. And then here's a, a detailed kind of close up of some, some of the vinyl text, the flower number four on the wall. And again, some of the other works in the exhibition from Soft Power Heart Margins. There was also included a drawing that I had done from a series of drawings that I started in 2010, a series called Like It Is. Um, this was a drawing that I had done before this show, before the invitation for the show, but it kind of fit in nicely with the theme of the exhibition. And I will show you a few more of these drawings from that series uh, as we move on. 
So here's a close up. This is graphite pencil on paper, 43 by 55 inches framed. I think it's 38 by 50, the actual drawing. Um, and then in 2018, late 2018, early 2019, I had an exhibition at Grant Walquist Gallery in Portland, Maine, titled Horror Horror. And I'm just gonna show you, I'm gonna go through some of the works from that exhibition. Um, there were, the central works in the show were these four monoprints, framed monoprints, kind of monoprint installation um, called Horror Horror. And so there are four near identical works. Um, everything is identical except for the yellow color field, which was hand painted onto each one. And so you're looking at uh, the, the monoprint in a cherry frame, which has the proportion, it's the proportions of a door. And then in front of it is a rubber circle on the floor. This, is, this work preceded um, soft power, hard margins, but I was still kind of thinking about art history, thinking about that legacy of art history and the work of people of color being included or excluded or relegated to a certain place in discourse. And then looking at modern, modernist kind of sculptures and how they were looking at kind of works that were made, um, works that were made outside of the Western world and thinking of those and using those as kind of a, a resource to kind of, uh, a re using those images or certain aesthetics as a resource to extract and, uh, to appropriate and kind of use in their own works. So in this work, this was kind of me flipping that and kind of pulling their works and referencing it, um, pulling their works and drawing attention to that um, in these prints. So this was a Modigliani um, sculpture. Uh, the black circle here, the actually first, the image that you're seeing here in the background of the crowd, that is a crowd from uh, gathered at a lynching. And I wanted to think about um, or draw attention to the kind of complicity, complicity of the audience, um, their spectatorship, rather than as we always do draw attention to kind of the mangled, the, the body and the corpse, but to think about kind of that gaze, that kind of nef nefarious gaze and how they're kind of complicit in this, in this act. And then you have the text here um, that uh, references a fable, the one about the three pigs. So again, it was kind of bringing together my thoughts, thinking about his, uh, art history, thinking about history in general, but thinking about it as a narrative, as a story that, that bears a, a, an important kind of, an important role in shaping our, our identity, you yeah. um, know, and also thinking about fairy tales, you know, as these allegorical tales, right, that we're supposed, are supposed to teach us something about how we're supposed to kind of operate and, and engage with the world, with each other. The, um, the black circle that you see here is kind of a nod to the kind of Warner Brothers sight gags. So I don't know, I've been watching, I have two toddlers and so they really like watching the Roadrunner cartoons, they, um, which is something I used to watch when I was younger. But you know, as I watch it now as an adult, you know, it's, it's kind of horrific, the idea that the Roadrunner is just trapped in this perpetual cycle of just like chasing after, uh, or the coyote is in this perpetual cycle, chasing after the roadrunner, kind of dying and then coming back to life. And he's just caught in this, in this cycle. Um, and it was something that I could kind of empathize with uh, being an artist. And like I said, thinking about my position as an artist of color, 
uh, in engaged in kind of art historical, engaged in art discourse and art historical discourse and the kind of trappings of the trappings of that. So observations, art history is a subgenre of history. History is a story that is inherently biased. It privileges certain historical facts over others creating dominant and non-dominant narrative arcs. So questions, how does history as a story function allegorically in the present? How do we understand, read, make meaning of history the same way we understand, read, make meaning of fables, mythological tales, and et cetera. So here's a detail there. And here's all four, where you can see the kind of subtle variation. This is another work that was in the exhibition called Like It Is Prelude, TM. Um, this was a text, a bit of text that I was reading at the time when I was reading the biography of Thelonious Monk. It was the prelude that really kind of stuck with me where the, the writer said, I have a choice here and I redacted it. I'll read the redacted version. I have a choice here between blanking about blank as blank is or as blank seems to be and is generally thought to be. There isn't any great difficulty about it because both sides are fertile ground, the stories merely differ in plausibility. So at the time that I had um, made this work, when I first made the work, um, Trayvon Martin was murdered. So I was watching, like a lot of people were watching this kind of, um, this battle between these different narratives um, about, about what happened and, um, about our ideas of, of, of justice, you know? And so uh, the observations and questions that kind of uh, preceded this work were during the public dialogue about Trayvon Martin's murder, different narratives about young Martin's identity were being pushed forward. The character of the victim versus the character of the murderer was deemed a significant arguing point in establishing justification of the offense. Questions, why, rhetorical question. Um, how do we negotiate contradictory elements occupying the same space? So this is, um, I probably didn't make it clear. So these are 50 sheets of eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper that were printed and they're glued to the wall in this matrix. Um, except for the green image there that is kind of on top and breaks free of the grid. Also in the exhibition were those drawings that I was, uh, pr that I previously mentioned, um, series called Like It Is. Um, and these are kind of these tightly rendered representations of uh, the title pages of books that have the word extraordinary in the title. Um, so I was going at the time that I started these, I was just going to the New York Public Library looking in their database for books with the word extraordinary, scanning those, and then doing these really kind of, yeah, doing these tightly rendered images that started off more like the one on the right. Um, but then when I started to make them in 2010, um, they were just these really staid kind of drawings that weren't really doing much for me. And then I happened to be doing a residency in New York. Um, it was, a, we had a studio in the basement and the lighting was really harsh and it kept casting these really hard shadows from the space that I couldn't really avoid. And it made it difficult to work on the drawing. So I finally just kind of surrendered and started drawing the, the shadows, the incidental shadows into the drawing, which became a really big turning point for these and, and made them more exciting for me. They added a sense of temporality and, and place and sight. I also started playing with uh, the orientation of the image, like not centering the image. Um, these are scaled up images of the book pages, obviously. Um, rather than projecting the image, I just used my shitty math that created, you know, and so that really horrible kind of, uh, uh, that really horrible process of kind of multiplying everything and measuring and then drafting that on the paper 
uh, created a kind of shift that I couldn't really determine. So I didn't really know where everything was going to fall on the page. So things are the image, the main image is kind of off center. So the margins become an important part of, of this work as well, that white space. And then I started to play, um, to play with the, the scanning of the, the book title page so that I would start to reveal the mechanism of that reproduction. So you can see the, the black and gray value of the scanner bed in some of these. This one is like it is, Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions. Like it is, Extraordinary Popular Delusions, The Madness of Crowds. Here is another, like it is, Those Extraordinary Twins. I don't think this one was in the exhibition, but I just added this in. And here's my shadow over to the left um, of me as I was drawing it. Another work in that show was this installation, um, the sculptural installation titled um, Untitled Number One, I Rhinoceros, Cast and Painted uh, Resin with Found Objects. I'm gonna speed up a little bit, Cooper, because I see it's approaching 645 and you probably want to leave some time for questions. You're doing great, take your time. Okay. So questions and observations. I make my art as a form of expression, a manifestation of ideas, thoughts, and questions intended to be received by an audience. I have no direct relationship to that audience. I am unaware of their needs and desires, but can only assume that they are similar to mine. Questions, is there any reciprocity in the indirect interaction between artist and viewer? What do I require of them? What do they expect from me? So I made this work in 2014. Around the same time I made that first piece with the hand holding the staff, where I started to, I was really actually just thinking about my relationship to a viewer, you know. Um, when someone crosses into the threshold of the museum, like what are they expecting? It's hard for me to kind of imagine that as an art, you know, from the position of an artist, but someone who's maybe not involved in the arts, like a family member when they go in, like, what are they, is there some kind of transcendental experience they're hoping to have? Or like, what is that, you know? Um, and I make my work with the purpose of, of, of sharing it with an audience, with the public. So what is that, what am I hoping that they kind of receive from the work. And you know, once the work is out there in the world, unless it's kind of reviewed, uh, you don't really know, you know? Um, maybe you'll get the experience of someone coming up to you and saying, oh, I saw your work, and, and they can kind of explain um, their, their experience with it. So these are the cast hands, my cast hands. And they're installed at a height, a kind of ambiguous height where it could be read as a, a, an offering, or it could also be like a receptacle. These were the found objects um, that I found in my studio space in Brooklyn, which was in a manufacturing building, and they mass produced. A lot of companies were mass producing these kind of objects, and these were particularly curious to me that they had these kind of classical motifs, but they were, you know, of course, produced en masse, and then many of them were discarded. They were just, there's probably 60, 70 just in a box. And so I took these, imagining that someday they would work themselves into a work. And then I think I've included a few images of the process of kind of making these. and then being painted. And I think I should probably, should I stop there, Cooper? No. No? Keep going? <laughs> yeah, keep going. Okay. We can, I mean, we can't get feedback from the abyss, but I want more, so. Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe just um, teach us a little more. Yeah, yeah, so here, um, here's some work. Again, like I said, this isn't in chronological order. So this work is work that I started a little bit before the pandemic. I'm always working on 
many different things. Like I kind of work in the studio rhizomatically. So I'll start with one work and it's kind of the seed for something else. So as I'm working, I'm making the work and then I'm thinking, and then I'm like, oh, and then I kind of start to move towards the sculpture. And often, you know, these, these works that I make are, are, part of a lar- are part of a large series. So I started these drawings, um, actually not, they're drawings, they're hybrid prints and drawings. So these happened after the large horror horror prints. So I was using some of the, the imagery, some of the motifs from, you know, uh, from the animated kind of cartoons, the kind of dust clouds and the motion kind of marks and things like that. And the images of the lynch mob, which is the print that you see on the top there. Um, this text field that you're seeing on the upper right those are all the names of the African American artists that I could, that I could think of, that I knew of, know of, and just thinking about us. It was a way for me to think about us as a unit, kind of working collaboratively, even though we make kind of a, make a diverse body, a diverse range of works. Um, but thinking about ourselves, um, thinking about us and our interactions kind of with the world and thinking about us symbolically, but also as individuals. Um, and so these, I don't know, I keep saying drawings. I guess I'll just keep calling them drawings. Um, drawing print hybrids. Um, they're oriented so that the text, the names are always level to the ground. So the way you're seeing it, the whole piece is skewed to privilege the, the orientation of, of the, the field of names. Here's a detail there. And I, those are all written in pencil. Here's another. And so I, I started working on these. It was a process of doing, laying down the print first, um, the screen print first, and then blocking out some of the text. And then there's the graphite powder, additions of graphite powder, pencil, airbrushing, sumi ink. Um, and so they're kind of done in stages. So I'm still in the process of working on these. So observations, again, and questions, the history of art relegates the contributions of Black artists to a narrow field of influence. How can I think about the diverse lineage of African-American artists as collaborative, as a collaborative unified body or force? Here's another detail. Here's another. And the text that you see here, again, the white text is the text from the fables or fairy tales. So this one is the one about the tortoise and the hare. And then I think this is probably the last work that I have in the slideshow. It's my earliest from grad school. Um, most of the work that I made in grad school was just completely, was embarrassingly horrible, except for uh, I think I left grad school with this one work that I kind of carried out with me. That was the beginning of a lot of questions that led me to uh, the subsequent work that I made postgraduate school. And so it was this, these digital uh, drawings called 47 Easy Pound Cakes like grandma used to make. And at the time my grandmother had died, so I was thinking about her legacy as, as one does when a family member passes away and kind of what they left behind and what we would remember. And she was, she uh, was a, she took care of the home and her kids and she cooked and she baked. And one of the things that she had baked was an easy pound cake. It was something that she made, she taught my mother, that my mother taught me. Um, and we had made it so often we didn't need a recipe. We just, it was really intuitive like how to make it. Um, and so at the time she died, I, I probably was at a coffee shop and I had a pound cake and I ate it and I was immediately offended and I was like, no, this is not it. So it started to raise questions for me about um, 
the quintessence of something like um, when it, and about the variation, like how many, how much variation is allowed before it's something ceases to be that thing and becomes something else. So using my grandmother's pound cake recipe as the basis, I Googled easy pound cakes and I found on the internet uh, 46 other recipes and that was it. Anything more than 46 was uh, another recipe that I already saw that was repeated just on another site. So with those and my grandmother's recipe became 47 easy pound cakes. And then I created these rule-based drawings where I edited, I kind of edited all the pound cake recipes into each other. So they kind of cancel each other out. They kind of render them, it renders them all illegible uh, and just kind of gives rise to this new form, which is a drawing. Um, so the arrows that you're seeing are arrows that redirect words that maybe appear in the next recipe, but in a different space. So I draw an arrow to move that word, or you'll see a strike through that gets rid of words that aren't in the following recipe. And then I did that process, these each drawing, so this one took about seven hours. Um, each one took about seven or eight hours. And then I decided that I would do this drawing, the same, the same drawing, same process 47 times. Um, so it created a 47 kind of unique uh, drawings. And then these are printed on, as you can see, the kind of index cards, which is what we used to put recipes on when we were kind of archiving them and storing them. And I think I started these in 2007 and I didn't finish them until 2012. My grandmother's easy pound cake is the quintessential pound cake. All others are of a lesser quality. How do our lives shape our understanding and judgments about the world? How much variation is allowed before, before a thing is classified as something else? What is the variability threshold? This is an image of some of them at Bard. So once they were displayed, they kind of wrapped around the entire exhibition space. Um, and then the last work, I guess that wasn't the last, um, is this clay work, ephemeral work. It's unfired clay. This is called Obviously God. Um, it is an image, a screenshot of a message board on a political website, um, which is basically there, there are people, there are members kind of anonymously arguing, uh, arguing about our relationship. It was, this whole article was posted as a response to President Obama's a national address about our relationship to the Muslim American community and advocating for, for a tolerance and understanding and empathy um, kind of in a post 9-11 world. And so this came from a conservative news site and there was a message board where uh, people were just kind of arguing back and forth. Um, and it kind of started with someone making the statement, you know, well, obviously God thinks this. So, you know, at the time, I was really interested in, in, in language and how we communicate, kind of in the digital, in in the digital realm and in virtual space, and the kind of breakdown of discourse and our ability to kind of speak to each other rationally, um, and you know, sentences that begin with you know, starting in a conversation with, asserting something like God's intention or understanding. I mean, where do you go from there? And naturally, of course, the conversation just broke down to kind of craziness. So uh, observations, language is porous, malleable, but specific and enduring. It's difficult to maintain integrity of discourse in virtual spaces. Questions, when there are so many voices occupying a space, vying for attention and affirmation, how can we establish mutual understanding and build respectful space for participation? Rather than it just being kind of a, sh a shouting board, you know, or a soapbox for everyone to kind of shout uh, out into the ether. 
um, here's a detail. So what I did is I took the, to describe the process, I took a screenshot um, of the message board. I printed it out. I blew it up to about 30 something by 50 inches. And then I cut all of the text and the images out, basically creating the super large stencil. And then I laid it over a slab of clay. And then I engraved all of the, I carved out all of the, uh, the text and the images. Um, I let that become bone dry. And as it dried, it started to crack. And then when it became dry enough, I kind of lifted it, the, it off the wood or I lifted the wood that was on slightly and then I just dropped it so that it would shatter into these pieces. Um, and then I would package these pieces up for the exhibition space and kind of make a map of the pieces and meticulously kind of put it back on the wall like a puzzle. So like I said, this is an ephemeral work. It doesn't last uh, after it's deinstalled. So each time I show this, I'm making it anew. Um, and that was, that was it. Great. So if you have time, I mean, I don't know, Kabir, I could take some questions or something. Um, yeah, let's do questions. First of all, uh, I would like to give you a round of applause and let's assume that there's like a hundred people in the abyss also <laughs> giving you a round of applause. Thank you, Naima. That was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> and that was really great. Um, I have a question in the chat, um, but I think we're supposed to use the Q&A thing. So if anybody has questions, please put them in the Q&A thing. But um, we have a question in the, in, in the chat that I'm going to yeah. throw at you. Um, do you develop your observations and questions as a framing device specifically for lectures? or do you develop them as a way of focusing before making the work? Uh, focusing before making the work. And it's something I've never really shared before in lectures. I mean, I, I think I did a lecture prior to this one, but um, I never thought of bringing those questions in, but there were always something that led, that led the work first, you know? It's my way of kind of, it's the way I move through my practice is just through a series of observations and questions about the world that are inspired by things that I'm looking at, things that I'm reading, conversations that I'm having, you know? I'm gonna build off that question. At what, at what point in the process are you asking those questions? Is it before you actually make anything or yeah. do you have something on the wall and you're, you're sort of responding to it? It's before, before I make anything. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's, it's totally before I make anything. And you know, those, I mean, and the work isn't an, isn't an attempt to answer those questions. The work is my way of just thinking through them like picking the questions apart, you know? Um, they never, yeah, there are never kind of propositions for like an answer to any of these, you know? But just me wrangling through or kind of negotiating certain, certain things, you know, ideas, thoughts. Great. Um, thank you, Rebecca Parker, for asking that question. Um, other questions? All right, we got from one from Noel Choi. Uh, how do you see printmaking in the context of malleable and enduring language as you described it, like the repetition, uh, yeah. copy, copies and immortalizing language and text? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm always, I mean, throughout all my, throughout all my work, and it's probably the reason why I'm an artist is that I'm, I'm fascinated with language. I'm fascinated with images and the different ways that we can kind of construct and make meaning. So whether it's, whether it's text or whether it's, it's, it's pictures. And of course, thinking about images, I'm, you know, I'm of a certain generation um, where I was, I was born, I'm of the generation that was kind of pre, it wasn't pre-computer, I was born in 77. So when I was still young, we had to type reports on a typewriter, you know? So these, these, these tools, these digital tools, the computers, they're not, uh, they're something that I wasn't kind of, something that I, I wasn't born into it and kind of using them. So I'm kind of at a position where I'm really kind of scrutinizing these modes of production, digital production and making images. You know, I'm used to these other kind of analog ways of, of making things and also um, yeah, I'm not, it's still weird to me 
the, the how we kind of are able to our ability to make images and the proliferation of images are just astounding to me. So I'm always thinking about those ways that that images are kind of put out in the world and, and produced in such a in such a large quantity. Um, so I'm always that 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 idea of kind of the serial or the multiple is prominent is is really prominent in my work. Um, it's, yeah, it's an important aspect of, of my making. And I think also in, in the process of, of, of making these multiples, I, I'm kind of scrutinizing that repetition and kind of looking for variation and subtlety and nuance and any shifts that happen, you know, like what is lost, what is retained. And that goes, and I think that goes back to also, you know, when I was doing the drawings, thinking about my reproduction, the reproduction of the image, these really kind of highly rendered reproductions with the hands that in some cases like appear to be photographic. But when you get close, there's like this aggre aggregate of like marks that you can see, you know? But then at the same time, referencing kind of the Xerox mode of, of reproduction, like using that as a source to reproduce the image, then this, then another layer of reproduction on top of that. Great. My I answer mean, it, might have meandered, but I hope that kind of touched No, I, th I think you covered it. I, I also like, it, it brings to mind the fact that you also, um, I mean, anytime you're using uh, any sort of print process, um, sort of traditional printmaking or, or or otherwise i think there's also kind of a reference to um media culture in general and it mm -hmm. feels like a lot of what you're addressing is like dominant yeah. narratives versus non-dominant narratives and mm -hmm. sort of like so that's really effective in in yeah. my mind um we got another question a question from nelly uh i love the use of copy machines for both aesthetic and for both the aesthetic and the immediacy mm -hmm. when some folks talk about these they call them obsolete what does that definition of this medium mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I don't consider it obsolete at all. It's just another another process, another way of of creating creating these images. I think that when it comes to technology, we're always looking for the kind of newer, quicker, faster, you know, way of of reproducing things or the slick kind of a slicker, I guess uh reproduction way of, of reproducing things so these are it's just another it's yeah to me yeah it doesn't even register as obsolete like when i see and there's no judgment so like you know when i see uh when i'm at kinko's or whatever i don't know is kinko still around or fedex and i see a copy machine it really is just like oh a copy machine you know like i'm just gonna make you know I'm going to make some copies versus, you know, when I'm looking at a scanner, um, some kind of high tech scanner, and then they're all, they, they all do something similar, you know? Um, and I use them, they're, they're a tool for me to also make my work. So each, each one is kind of rich in its own qualities and ways of working and its output. Cool. Thank you. I have a, a I have a question, and maybe it's not such a question, but it's just an observation about. Um, I mean, I think the last time I saw your work in person was at Smack Mellon when it was the extraordinary. I think it was Smack. Oh Mellon, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and it was when you were just kind of starting those extraordinary uh, yeah. pieces. And um, I think of like work when we did like the Scott Hegan introductions. I think of the pound cake pieces, and I feel like particularly like the pound cake pieces make me think of like this interest in um, objectivity versus subjectivity mm -hmm. or like subjective experience. And then I'm thinking about like the work in the horror horror show, the three, the three little pigs piece. And mm -hmm. um, I, I realize there's like a real shift that's happened. And maybe it's like, maybe I'm like over, overly simplifying and it hasn't happened throughout your work, but just between those two bodies of work, I, I see like, like the three little pigs piece is not about an objective versus subjective experience. It's about 
turning the camera around. Yeah. Um, experience like nobody's denying that the lynching is happening. Yeah. You're just yeah. turning the camera around. Nobody is denying that um, Modigliani was, you know, lifting lifting inspiration from yeah. African artists and sort of like calling it his own. Yeah. You're just sort of turning it around. So yeah. Um, yeah. If you could like talk about that a little bit. I, yeah. I mean, and it has to do with the kind of ebb and flow. I and mean, you probably experience it in your own practice about just like thinking about like the work in the world and then thinking about you as an artist in the world and then thinking about your work's relationship to art history then thinking about your your relationship as an artist you know to other artists in art history like that kind of like back and forth that that happens and then thinking about you know an audience and thinking about your relation to that audience the relationship the work to that audience and then what moves through that you know so i think that that just that that just kind of manifests itself in different ways in the works throughout the years you know mm. depending on where like where my head is at or where i'm thinking or about kind of my position the work's position the audience's position and how we're all kind of engaged in this activity together of of making the work of experiencing the work you know yeah i mean i wonder too if and i could be totally projecting here but i think you know when you're in grad school and you're making work you're oftentimes um you know you're steeped in your own experience and you don't think of someone like modigliani as a peer mm -hmm. and when you're an yeah. artist working in the world in dialogue you know Modigliani is your peer, right? Like yeah, that's, yeah, they're, they're yeah. not, it's, he's not someone you look up to anymore. He's sort of like you're working on their level, right? So. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And you know, in grad school, like those questions about my relationship to art history, you know, it started in art school. There was kind of this proverbial kind of art school question, like, where do you see your work in relationship to art history? Or, you know, like, where do you position yourself? So, like, and you know, when you're in art school, whether you're an undergrad and you're 18, you're just like, ah, you know? <laughs> you know, and then maybe sometimes even in grad school, you know, it's like you're, you're sure. figuring out what the work is, like where the work is, you know? So to be able to, to be asked that question, to like pull out and then say, okay, well, it's situated somewhere here. Like, it's a really difficult thing to kind of think about when you're in the throes of actually figuring out what the hell it is. You know? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it goes, it turns from like a sort of subtle nod or a subtle reference to like a dialogue, I mm -hmm. think at a certain point, or maybe over time. Yeah. Great. Um, let's give it another minute or two to see if we have any other questions. Yeah, sure. If you're cool with that. Yeah, yeah. I'll maybe Thank move you. the image a little bit. Thank you to the folks who already asked questions. 2K, Noel, and Nellie. I have another one that's kind of a sort of banal question, but I, mm -hmm. I want to throw it out there. Um, particularly because you're so facile with so many different modes of working and yeah. you know I, I i deeply empathize with you i'm less facile with all these things but <laughs> I, I i'm like i really um empathize with this sort of observation that's like oh you use a, a, a different material or a different process for like every piece and yeah sort of like is that uh is that sort of like uh sort of a subtle way of saying that my work isn't coherent or is that a way of like saying that I'm a masterful at all these things? like you yeah, never really yeah. know how to take it um but I was wondering about like your choices in um so so like in terms of just kind of um meta process right like are you um like oh man I, I have this idea and I really want to make a silk screen or is it sort of like I've been thinking about this what is the most logical or, or sort of like least logical or um material or process to use. Yeah. Um, what's what's sort of your order of operations or your sort of workflow in terms of um, choosing materials and processes in conjunction with content? Yeah, it's really hard for me to break that down, like the process. I have to think about whether or not it's consistent from, from work to work. But I mean, like I said, it's, so it does start with the question. And I think, 
it starts with not just a question, but a series of questions. And it's a network of questions that are directed, that are, that are related, but they're addressed to different things. And I think that that network of questions helps me make the decision about the material and the process. So I think somewhere in those questions, like I said, there might be questions that are directed at the world, you know, like larger questions, then maybe within that network, there is an offshoot that's related, that's a question that's directed at material, mm -hmm. you know? So if, I, if, I'm, if there's a question, a broader question about language, and then that leads me down a path of questioning about the ways that language is represented, maybe in print or text, mm -hmm. and then it goes from there. So that I under, so that maybe I'll realize, oh, that there's an element of either a print-based element that's going to happen, you know, text will be present in some form, um, or maybe even with soft power, hard margins, there was the, for me, the really kind of complex, um, there was, for me, a complex, complex question about the hierarchy of legibility between image, object, what was it? I forgot what I, what I had said, but it was like, uh, the relationship, the legibility between image, object, and something else. Can't remember what it was exactly. So it was, so that work became, I started to think about ways where I can kind of play with that. Mm -hmm. The legibility of those three things, of text, image, and object, mm -hmm. and think about ways that they could be present together, you know? Yeah, that's great. I mean, I thought I, I, that question came to mind particularly because I think of like, there's really like logical choices that seem to be made, like the takeaways being on newsprint and being on yeah. the format because yeah. it's laid out like a newspaper. Yeah. And then it seems like choices that are completely antithetical, right? Like yes. the, the one of the, the final piece you showed of the, you know, a message board, which is like, you don't get much more ephemeral than an internet yeah. message board. And you, yeah. you present it as this like using clay, which you don't get more material than that yeah. in some ways. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. it creates a great, great tension there. We have some other questions that came in. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to throw them at you if that's cool. Yeah. We have a question from Jin Park. Uh, how would you describe your relationship with contemporary art and art history now compared to your time in art school as a female POC artist? Say that one more time again, because I, I know a Jin Park. So I'm like, is this my Jin Park? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Say that. What's, what is that question again? It's how would you describe your relationship with contemporary art and art history now compared with your time in art school as a female POC artist? Yeah, that's a good question, Jin. Um, now versus art school. Well, I think now I have a, a kind of a, what I feel like is a more mature understanding of art history. Before art history was just like the Bible, right? Like there were these figures, you don't question them, they're static, they're immovable. And I think now I kind of understand art history as a narrative, you know, that has a very specific function, a kind of very specific kind of social and, and political function, which is something that I didn't really think about when I was in art school. It was just like, you know, uh, whatever Picasso said was the word of God and da 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 da, da you know? Um, and so now I'm thinking about art history less like this kind of pantheon of figures to be worshipped, but more as a story about, um, about creative kind of ingenuity about power, about privilege. And this goes back to the Adrian Piper quote where she was saying, proposing that freedom of expression is a right. It's it, uh, granted by institutions, you know? It's sanctioned by institutions, you know? Um, there are gatekeepers, you know, at the time, you know, um, at the time any kind of great work is made, there are, there are thousands of works being made, like thousands of other artists kind of toiling. And this work is kind of picked and plucked, you know, from, from the masses of, of works as being significant. So what is that significance? Like what is being said through that so selection of this work exemplifying X, Y, or Z, right? 
so yeah, that's kind of my relationship to it now versus in art school. Great, thank you. We have a, a question from Eric Mueller. Um, do you feel like there's an element of humor in your work? Could you elaborate on the use of car the cartoon elements? Yeah, there's an element of, of humor, or maybe I would say the, the absurdity. And I think that's just kind of my personality. It's just at some point, and it's and maybe it's just kind of, uh, yeah, yeah. I would say absurdity. I would I would say absurdity. There's something that's just tragic, comic about kind of the human endeavor, right? <laughs> the human project. I mean, it's very poignant. It's very moving. It's terrifying. It's horrific, but it's also kind of absurd. And so I think that that, you know, that humor absurdity kind of entering in my work, you know, the idea of drawing the title page of a book at this big scale, you know, really meticulously rendered is to me, it's like kind of stupid, you know? <laughs> um, so I, but I think that embracing the absurdity um, is again, it's me negotiating these kind of conflicting responses that I have. You know, it's like I said with the Roadrunner, you know, my children are sitting there laughing when an anvil drops on his head. And I'm sitting there, it's like, my God, he died again. And he's gonna get up and he's gonna do it again. And he's gonna die again, you know? A so very I'm, violent and painful death. Very viol violent and painful and, and painful deaths, you know? Um, and this kind of relentless kind of, yeah, Sisyphean pursuit, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, that's my, there is, there is an element of, of the absurd in the work. And I think, you know, all of those things, I don't make deliberate attempts to fold all of that in there, but I feel like the works end up being um, very layered in the same way, kind of my thoughts on a lot of these subjects are very layered and complicated, you know? Mm -hmm but hopefully through the work it's distilled in a way where it can be, I don't know, it's kind of all of that is distilled in a way, I don't know, maybe you could tell me <laughs> the way where, not that where it's like simplified, but. Digestible, right? Like, I mean, I think it's like a very, in my mind, it's a very, you're expressing like an ambivalence and sort of contradiction, contradictory sort of feelings about certain things, which is how, mm -hmm most of us move through the world yeah yeah um, yeah but i yeah i know to if you want me to tell you i mean i think it's it's like yeah, it's go like, ahead. yeah no it's just like it's it's like uh that i wouldn't digestible is actually the wrong word but it's like there's it, you provide multiple entry points and then yeah. um and then there's like in my mind there's like a, a the way I, I always experience your work is like there's an initial reading and then there's like something that undercuts that and kind of contradicts it and then I'm like oh so it's about this and then there's like something else that sort of it's almost like a um uh like a like a like a serpentine right like it's kind yeah. of like double backing yeah. on itself the more time you spend with the work yeah yeah thank you yeah. let's give it one more minute for questions and then uh and then we'll call it All right, I think that's it. Should we call it? Yeah, let's do it. Let's call it. Great. Thank you so much, Naima. This is really wonderful. It was Thank great. Thank you, to... Cooper. Yeah, and it, you're welcome. I just, I'm just like so grateful that you you uh, accepted my invitation to yeah, to come yeah. share your work with us, and um, always a joy to uh, to talk to you and see you, yeah. and always a joy to um, hear you hear you speak about your work. So thank, thank you so much. And um, I don't know if you're able to see the chat, but you're getting a lot of um, a lot of love in the chat. Oh, thank you. So yes, um, yes, we have so magic. Thank you, and thank you so much, Naima. Your talk was amazing. Thank you so much. Looking forward to meeting with you tomorrow. Coming from some print media students, so yes, cool. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks again, and um, yeah, thanks everyone who asked questions as as well. Um, and somebody asked if the recording will be public later. Yes, I believe it will. And lots of thank yous. All right, cool. Thanks again, Naima. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye.